an online. Okay, wonderful. Here we go. All right. Well, I want to welcome everybody to the Economic Development Finance Com Standing Committee. Before I call the meeting to order, I would like to announce that some committee members, staff, and the public are attending remotely via Zoom, as well as on site. All participants joining by phone should mute their phones when not speaking to avoid background noise. When speaking, please speak directly into a microphone to ensure everyone listening is able to hear your comments and to ensure a clear record is made. During the meeting, please make sure that you announce yourself by name and title every time you speak so the public that is observing knows who is speaking. This is critical given the number of remote participants and his current guidance from the Kansas Attorney General. The public is allowed to participate by Zoom or submit comments by email prior to the meeting, and those comments will be included in the record of this meeting. The public may also indicate their intent to provide remote public comment by contacting the clerk's office by 5 p.m. the Thursday before the meeting. The public also will have an opportunity to provide brief comments either by telephone or via Zoom from the fifth floor conference room of the municipal office building. I will now call the meeting of the Economic Development Finance Standing Committee to order and would ask the clerk to please call roll. Roll call. Haley? Davis? Here. Townsend? Present. Stites? Here. McKiernan? Here. Burroughs? Here. Thank you, committee. Uh, have we heard if uh, Mr. Haley will be joining us this evening? I have not heard any comment from him. Great. Thank you. Let me mute this. Okay, uh, I'd ask the clerk if there are any revisions for tonight's agenda. Yes, Commissioner, we have one addition, item number three under the committee agenda. It's a resolution regarding the American Royal Association industrial revenue bonds. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, we have no minutes to approve this month, so we'll move right on into item number one, which is a resolution. It's a real estate purchase agreement with the Kansas City, Kansas Community College. Uh, and I don't see Jeff Conway, but I. Uh, this is Wendy with legal. We do have Dr. Mosier, I believe, who is going to. Um, yep, there he is. He'll be presenting this topic. Okay, Dr. Mosier. Dr. Mosier, president of the case in Kansas City, Kansas Community College. Welcome to committee. I just anticipated our legal staff would be giving the briefing, but you will be making the presentation this evening. Sure. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, commissioners and everyone for having us here this evening. Um, this is a resolution uh, very similar to what we had before you approximately a month or so ago. Um, after we had that meeting, we found out some additional information about the block, which changed the orientation of the education and partner building. Um, so I have a set of slides that kind of walks through that and happy to um, answer any questions. So at our last meeting, um, this is what we had made the request of the commission, which was uh, the standing committee and the commission, which was approved. The boxes in red outline the pieces of the property that are owned by the unified government um, that we were looking to uh, obtain at that time. Oops, sorry. And then literally about three days after the full commission meeting, we received the official survey back. And from the measurements on the official survey, um, we found through our architect that the, the distance south to north to the line of the alley was about 12 feet shorter than the measurements that they previously had when we have been doing all the uh, illustrative and conceptual work for the last couple of years. So the dotted line is the alley and the heavy red line is the outline, the footprint of the building. Um, we looked at trying to stretch the building uh, to make it stay within the building parameters of that space. Um, and it made the building actually so thin that it would not be a functional building. 
So we looked at different types of layouts. Um, this is the one that the partner group um, landed on, which changes the orientation from the educational slash partner building going north and south along 7th Street, which puts the northern half of the building um, on the current parking lot for the Willa Gill Center, which we had not requested um, that land at that time. The initial the, um, desire was in the long run to have the entire city block. Uh, of course, we didn't want to replace, uh, uh, displace any services to Willa Gill. Um, we got together with the mayor's office, with um, the city administrator, UG Legal, City Planning, um, Willa Gill, uh, people who operate Willa Gill, so St. Mary's and the um, Hot Lunch Group, and talked about some different options, this being one of them, which left the Willa Gill building still within um, UG ownership, but with the desire of the long-term desire to obtain the entire block. Um, at the conclusion of that building, this is the uh, layout of what we decided to request from both uh, this committee and the full commission. Um, and with this in the resolution, you'll see that we still are maintaining uh, our original promise from several years ago that we won't interfere with the operations of the Willa Gill Center, um, either during the construction period or afterwards until there is an alternate location found. So we still have that same commitment made. Uh, but with the change of the orientations, it's actually, uh, a more beautiful building and will have a greater impact, I believe, on downtown KCK for future development. So I want to just show you an illustration of what the, the new center will look like. Um, the This is the east side, and then the, the technical labs have not been illustrated out by the time that we needed to put this together, but this is where the building sits and you can still see the Willa Gill Center. During construction, as we will be um, using the parking lot on the west side of Willa Gill, we will make a concrete barrier on the east side of Willa Gill of the appropriate size um, so that, and it'll be marked only for Willa Gill employees and patrons so that they can pull in and park. And it's actually a better parking location than the Western side, because there's about an 18 foot difference in grade from the parking lot down to the center. So this will put the parking on the same plain as the footprint of the of the Willa Gill Center. And you can see there's on the west side of Willa Gill, there is a location for trucks to drive around and through. Um, and then for the semis, we would do a temp temporary and possibly a permanent by cutting in to the sidewalk uh, for semi parking for food deliveries. They don't make they don't take any deliveries into the back south side of the Willa Gill where there is actually actually a loading dock, but it stands eight feet off the surface from the ground in the alley. So they use the west entrance. So we would even tear out and build them a better sidewalk uh, for to take deliveries from Nebraska Avenue um, and purchase them a um, hydraulic lift cart so that they can move things easily as well, wanting it just to make it as easy and convenient for them as possible. Um, I just included this because th this is our timeline. We're, we're still on it. Um, we've continued to receive very good funding for the project. It's a, it's a great benefit for both the community and the taxpayers. Um, 
it will be a $65 million project still, but with the money that we've raised for our Wyandotte County taxpayers, uh, they're getting the building for approximately 18 cents on the dollar um, if we continue in this same fundraising um, category. Um, and then also, just as an additional note, um, next week we do have a uh, proposal for the KCKCC Board of Trustees to also reduce all our mill levy by a full mill, which is 1.92 approximately million dollars. So we're still trying to balance those things out as we're looking at this project. Um, but with that, uh, we have the resolution for the purchase of the entire north half of uh, the block here and 600 State Avenue. With the contingencies of that, we will lease back the Willa Gale building to the unified government so that the operations of Willa Gale can continue through the construction and even after the construction period um, until a alternate location is found. And that concludes my presentation. And this is Wendy Green with Legal. Um, I just wanted to reiterate everything that Dr. Mosier has said that it, this has been through legal for review and um, the real estate purchase agreement has been agreed to between the different attorneys and the different um, organizations. So, and the resolution states that what you don't see is a lease for the lease back, that will be a separate agreement. So the lease terms you're not gonna see in the purchase agreement because that's just not the appropriate place for them. There will be a separate lease agreement for that. So Wendy, will that uh, lease agreement come back to this commission before full commission or will it go before full commission? I don't know that the lease agreement actually has to be approved. It's not typical that the commission approve leases. Um, that's usually a county administrator function. Um, so he will either approve it or if he determines that it would be better to go in front of the commission as maybe an information only item, then that's how it would come in front of the commission. But I believe it would just be the county administrator that would um, sign the lease and it would not need commission approval. I asked that because mm -hmm. of the concern of Willa Gill in right. part of the subject matter. And I know the commission, uh, many commissioners have spoke about the uh, Willa Gill issue. So I just wanted to uh, verify if we were gonna have an opportunity to hear about Correct. That. Well, I, I do believe the purchase agreement takes that into consideration. So I think we're covered with the purchase agreement. And if I may, I forgot one item. Um, it was meant to go on the agenda, but did not make it in time that our, our desire is to expedite this if approved by the standing committee to the full commission on Thursday, as we have plans to start the selective uh, demolition of the church in September. Okay. That's also legal's understanding. Thank you. I meant to bring that up too. Thank you. Yeah. Basically, you want to fast track this then? Yes, fast track this. Thank you. Um, it, with, uh, next point, are, are there any questions, comments from the commission and, and Commissioner Townsend? Good evening, Mr. Chair, and to all present, uh, good evening, Dr. Mosier, and I think Commissioner um, Burroughs uh, alluded to the question that I had about the lease agreement. And I see in section two that this pertains to uh, the college leasing back to the unified government, the Willa Gill Center, its grounds and parking agreement. So, Councillor Green, that's the lease that you were referring to? Yes, Commissioner Townsend, that's correct. Okay. Uh, and as I read it, this, the resolution before us tonight talk specifically though about the two pieces of property, the 600 State Avenue and 645, which Dr. Mosier's presentation depicted. So to me, though, I guess those are the three main things, those two pieces of specifically identified um, property, and then the lease back agreement, uh, because uh, Chairman Burroughs was correct. I did have some concerns about where this would leave uh, Willie Gill. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, Commission? Uh, uh, Commissioner McKiernan? Thank you. I just want to verify. So will the community college then take over the ongoing maintenance of that structure and the parking lot next to it? 
after the lease back or after the sale rather? There, there has been some discussion about that at a very recent, but there's not been a conclusion on that. We will ensure it as, as the owners, um, as we're leasing it back, there is no revenue stream for the college to be able to afford the, the, the maintenance. So that's just a, a, cons, uh, a conversation still yet to be had. Oh, I, I apologize. I thought that was a conversation that had been had. Um, prior to that, I do think it would be good for us to verify who will have the ongoing responsibility for maintaining that building. Wendy? Thank you. Um, I believe it was just agreed to today that the UG will continue maintaining that building just as we have been in consideration of them giving us an indefinite time to use it. And then um, also, we will also have a first right of refusal for an indefinite amount of time, if they decide that they are not going to need that land for their development, we get first right of refusal to get that back. Should they choose as the property owner to then want to sell it? Correct. Okay. And both of those periods would be indefinite amount of time instead of limited. Commissioner Townsend, you have another question? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner Townsend, District 1, uh, I'm a little bit confused, and Commissioner McKeon is kind of getting to the point that I'm still not clear about. This resolution talks specifically about the two pieces of property for sale. By what document is the unified government, if at all, selling the property on which Willa Gill is currently located? And this is Wendy Green with Legal again. There is also a purchase agreement, um, the terms of which have uh, just recently been uh, approved by all the parties. It's provided here on, it was on the tables. It was provided for the commissioners. I don't know if it was emailed out. Was it, uh, Monica's indicating that it was also emailed to everyone. So there's the resolution whereby the commission approves the purchase agreement. And then there's a separate purchase agreement that will be signed off on by the county administrator. A separate purchase agreement. that Will that come to this body before that sign off is accomplished? Yeah, I believe it was emailed out, but the final, the final agreement has been uh, finalized by both sides. And that was what was emailed and the resolution is what is approving that agreement, and it will go to full full commission if passed today through a fast track to this Thursday. And so the okay. commission itself doesn't sign the agreement, if that's what you're asking. It's only going to be signed by the county administrator, but this resolution is the commission approving that purchase agreement. Yeah, I, I'm still a bit confused because the resolution that I'm looking at that was sent, you know, a couple of weeks ago doesn't talk about the property uh, specifically that's Willie Gill. So you're saying there's another resolution or, or agreement somewhere? If we may, uh, Commissioner Townsend. I believe Commissioner McCarran uh, might be able to shed some light on this. Well, I hope Thank I can, because I'm looking at the result. There's a, a blank resolution that's included in our packet for tonight. Right. And in section two, it talks about lease back the Willowgill Center and its grounds and parking areas. So right. So that specifically um, designates the property to be leased back. Are you looking for something different than that? Well, we're talking about the lease back. What is the document, I guess, that turns over ownership that says the unif unified government is selling the Willie Gill property? Well, that's in section one of the same uh, draft resolution that the, uh, approves the sale of all of 600 State and 645 Nebraska Avenue together with any other properties such as alleyways that may be owned by the unified government for this in consideration of the sum of $10. Yeah, and see, I I looked at that as jo Dr. Mosier's um, presentation tonight showed the 600, the 645, but it didn't particularly identify Willie Gill as part of that sale. So this section one paragraph information is intended to cover Willie Gill as well? 
that's my understanding is that it covers the entirety of the 600 uh, no it'd be the 645 property anyway the property that abuts nebraska from 6th to 7th the entire parcel would be sold and then the willa gill center and its adjacent parking would be leased back and wendy correct me if i'm wrong on that no that is absolutely correct okay could i see that schematic one more time because i was focusing on the 600 the 645 and it didn't seem to me that it identified the willa gill other than with reference to this lease and i'm saying well when did we sell it it's slight I'm sorry, it's slide seven. This is Greg Mosier. Oh, I can do it here. I'm... Madam Commissioner, here's the slide they were talking about, and the Willa Gill Center sits in the middle of 645 Nebraska. That um, address covers from 6th Street to 7th Street. Okay, you just answered my question for clarification. Thank you so much. I have Thank no you. further questions. Thank you, ma'am. Commissioner Stites. Sites District 7. So I have a question of going back, Wendy, to the maintenance of the building that we are selling, right? So we're selling a building, but yet we're still on the hook for the maintenance of a building we no longer own. Yes, and that's actually typical under a lease agreement. Most commercial buildings are rented under a triple net basis, which means that the less or the lessee does all the maintenance on the building. But but we're no longer the owner. No, but we are going to be not the less. We're leasing it out. No, we're the lessee under this situation and that's so, you know, more mo most commercial leases that's how it works the lessee does the maintenance and the lessor only takes care of major structural issues if under normal triple net lease and we are the lease lessor. lessee we are the leaseor so the lessee let me get this straight <laughs> right the community college is the lessor because they're right. going to be the owners we will be the lessees because right. we will be leasing it from them but you're saying any major repairs, right? If it was a structural issue, let's say the building started to cave in, right. it something would, like that would be on the community college as the owner of the building. But if it's HVAC, if right. it's plumbing, if it's this floor got messed up and we need to fix it, everything that we've been doing currently to just keep the property going is what we would continue to do. Although it's not a structure that is bringing in revenue. Correct. Because that is part of the agreement and in consideration of us doing that. It's only a part of the agreement if we agree to it. That is correct. But that would be part of the lease. That's what's in the proposal. So um, I wasn't going to bring this up, but since it's in your proposal uh, or your presentation tonight, it also it says that also a planned mill reduction by one full mill. Um, this, this current year, how many mills is your budget going up? Our budget is... Our budget mill is flat. Our flat mill is, I believe it is 27.25. That includes both the regular uh, real estate and the personal or the capital. It's about 25 and two, and two. So from last year to this year, how much has your budget increased off of from last year to this year? It's how a, many mills? So it's approximately, uh, with the reduction of one mill, is approximately 3%. Okay, how many mills? The, what I just described is- no, I want percent. How many mills? Right, that's what I'm talking about. It, total mill is, I believe, 27.25. So it's about 25 mills on the um, regular revenues and approximately- two mills on the capital. I don't have those exact numbers in front of me. I apologize. But I it guess is what I could say is though, from last year to this year, your uh, amount of revenue you're, that you're bringing in from last year to this year is significantly more than last year. It's approximately 3%. Which is what number? How much? I would have to calculate that. Okay, I'm, we're, we're here. I'm ready. Yeah. Uh, we... Just for clarification, are you asking 
the uh, dollar value due to the new appraised value. Correct. Correct. Uh, assessed value, I guess. Assessed value say. from last year to this year is a is a is a number, right? If it was one point nine two million from last year to this year, that would be equivalent to one mil. Right, because that's what was presented earlier. That a mil is one point nine. He said three percent. I'm looking at a six mil increase. So six mil increase, which that means roughly, roughly, that's twelve million more dollars that's being brought in um, from the taxpayers from last year to this year. But there's no room for in the budget for maintenance on the a building that we're sent that we are um, uh, selling the college. I don't understand it. Yeah. Um, I don't know that $12 million from last year to this year is not a, a, a insignificant amount of money. It's not a $12 million increase. I, I can guarantee you that, um, but I don't have those numbers in front of me. I bring that up as the college is uh, both trying to improve the education of our community, which creates a healthier and wealthier community and additional taxpayers. But at the same time, we're also being cognizant of the county's uh, tax rate, and we're doing our part by reducing it by $1.92 million is, is what I what will be presented to the Board of Trustees, and which I do believe that they support. And that's what I was trying to get at is uh, 1.2, let's just round it up to $2 million sure. out of, out of, out of what amount, right? Out of 10 million, 8 million, 9 million. I don't, I don't know. And commissioner yeah. Burroughs says he thought it was around 12 million. So I don't know. I don't, I don't, I'm not uh, able to figure that up. So that's why I was asking what the increase is from last year to this year. And, um, okay. but I hope, hopefully we can get that. Um, and, and I, and, and this may or may not be the right place for that, but there is also, and I agree with you about the economic impact and and hopefully with um, with this facility that other things, it sparks more uh, development, right? I mean, yes, that's sir. the thing. But also there's an ongoing maintenance cost, right? Up to this to this location. We've got to hire more teachers. We've got to hire uh, people to staff it. We have to hire janitors. We have to have all the people that it takes to run this new facility, which I'm afraid that we will probably never, ever, ever, ever see another mill reduction um, after this one, this um, gratuitous one mill uh, gets put into this budget, and then we'll never see it, another one. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission? The only question I would have, Dr. Moser, you, you had talked about the alley, the original uh, engineering de determined that the building was encroaching by 12 feet into the alley? Approximately, yes, sir. And so are you continuing to go back with that plan and just going to truncate the alley or uh, is into the parking area on the east side? Is that how you plan on doing it to take control of that additional 12 feet of the alley? Uh, our, our request is to vacate the alley because the building spans all the way from the south to the north. Um, we'll be putting the utilities and everything underground so we can maximize the off-street parking, um, and there will be no alley. I, I, I know you've changed the design of the building on the front, which is a very attractive building, by the way, I must say. Thank you. It's the geography of the, of the corner a lot better. But the new building that you proposed, I think in one of the other prior plans, it showed an, a gateway off of 7th Street into the main entrance of the building. And I think you were using that alley cutout portion. Did, is, am I mistaken on that original plan? Uh, may we go back to the slides? Sure, absolutely, please. I just want to I, get the clarification that we are going to vacate the alley and build the building wider than, than uh, versus uh, the length, lengthening out as you had stated. Yes, sir. Uh, three years or pre-COVID, here, here's the latest schematics. So there's no entrant, no driveway from 7th Street onto the property. There's one from Nebraska um, and one from 6th Street. And there's probably gonna be an exit onto State Avenue. I believe what you might be thinking about it is pre-COVID when we had two buildings. So the community college was going to be on the southern half of the block. Uh, 
where the earlier illustration shows, then we were going to retain the alley. And then on the northwest corner of the block was the health and wellness center. Um, and with COVID and the extreme escalation, the uh, Wyandotte Behavioral Health Network and the YMCA had to drop out of the project. So we took SWOPE and added it to the one building. Understood. And actually, I think it addresses some of the concern of pulling out on 7th Street. That would have been with the old design. There would have been a concern about traffic flowing out on to 7th Street right after a light. So uh, this is a much better layout. Thank you, sir. Any other comments from the commission? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk if there are any comments from the public. No comments were received and no hands are raised. Oh, oh. Oh, thank you. I, I do see Commissioner oh, Townsend had her hand up. Oh, Commissioner Townsend, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Townsend, District 1. Um, Dr. Mosier, uh, the last comment uh, concerning a healthcare organization that was going to come in, I guess, in the future as part of the design. Has there been any thought about including the services that Willa Gill provides as part of that. So that even at some point as Willa Gill as we know it is not there building wise, those same services are still offered there as part of and contiguous with uh, the new college. And I was thinking about this because I went to an urban university, Philadelphia University of Pennsylvania, and the university had to coexist with everyone else who lived, you know, in that neighborhood. Uh, those who were houseless, those who were in need, as well as those of us who were students at the university. And uh, just wonder if any thought had been given to that concept. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Um, so Swope Healthcare is still part of the project. They will pro be providing full health care services, including dental and vision. They're a federally qualified health care provider, so can provide those health care services to uh, individuals with low income, no income. So they are the entire fourth floor of the current building. The uh, Price tag on the construction right now, all inclusive, is six hundred and fifty dollars a square foot. Um, so we would not be able to build that additional square footage to incorporate the services currently provided by um, the Willa Gill Center. Well, I, I thank you uh, for that information, Dr. Mosher. I'll, I'll just state on the record, I hope that the services that Willa Gill has provided for years is allowed to continue for as long as possible at, at that location. Um, it, it's just part of the community. It's hard to relocate those services. I mean, it's challenging. And universities and other um, strong community organizations have to realize that you know, you come to a community and it's difficult to ignore what's already there and what is needed. So we're talking about a lease. I hope it's not a one-year lease. I hope it's allowed to continue and those services remain there for a long time to come. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Any comments from the commission? Commissioner Biden. I'm sorry, Commissioner McKiernan. Thank you very much. So, Wendy, would I assume that to get to Commissioner Townsend's point about it's not a one-year lease, as I read this, it says that Section 4 says the UG has a the right of first refusal should the college ever choose to sell. That would effectively be our guarantee of services continuing, right? In addition, it's my understanding that as consideration for us maintaining the building, we also have an indefinite lease. We get to lease that building and provide these services until we can find a different location. 
I appreciate that. And I wonder if that language might be good to include in this resolution. I think you could make that part of your motion, definitely. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, if I were to do that, that could be saved until the full commission meeting, correct? Correct. Thank you. Commissioner McCarran, and is that a, in section two? Is that the language that you're looking for? Well, in you no, know, because in section two, all I see is lease back and the building and enough parking spaces to accommodate the number of staff and clients and the building to be used substantially the same basis as is currently being used. Um, and I will say substantially the same basis is makes me wrinkle my brow a little bit. I'm not exactly sure what that means. But what I'm looking at is nowhere else here does it say that Willa Gill will be able to operate indefinitely other than we have the right of first refusal should you as the new owner elect to want to sell that 645 Nebraska plot. So I don't see anything here that says um, there is an indefinite. So I don't see the language that Wendy was just referring to. That's correct. It's not in the current version of this resolution. Okay. No. Okay. Thank but you. If you and, choose and to I pass it on, you could make the motion. And, and, I, add it. and I personally do think that um, if we were to move forward with this, that we should explicitly declare that Willa Gill is a current and an important part of our downtown and service provision to people in our downtown, and that Willa Gill will be afforded the opportunity to continue to operate indefinitely until the need changes or until they choose not to or until we choose not to. And I think that should be explicitly stated in here, rather than just saying, well, we have the right of first refusal in the case of a sale. So we'll we'll get to that. Yeah, yes, sir. And that is our intent. So that's perfectly fine. Commissioner Stites. And I think what's important is to is to, to notate is for right of first refusal at what price. Right. And I'll be completely honest, I don't know if that's been negotiated or not, but I will well, make I sure that, that we address it. Be. It, it, is it definitely is it in the agreement be if it hadn't been. Yeah. Okay. And then it's um, at the purchase. So will that location there's a there's a purchase contract. Sorry, there's a, there's a purchase contract that was that was submitted to the um, committee as well. That's my understanding. We haven't got that. We have the resolution draft. No contract. Is it not? Was it at your seats? There was a copy of it here. I, this right here, purchase agreement. Yeah. Blue sheet. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, this was not included with the original. I think this just got finalized. Just got. Just got finalized. Okay. okay. And Do you know it specifically what section that was in? I, I don't recall the specific section, but basically, the the right of first refusal would be at the same price that we're paying for the property. It would. So it'd be ten dollars. Oh, thank you. That's section eleven. I'm sorry, section eleven, on page four. And, and as I understand it, just for for whatever um, benefit this is, um, we would be leasing back the um, building and grounds for the Willow Gill Center, but the unified government is the entity that has the lease and the license with the occupants of the Willow Gill Center. So there, there's actually a separate set of documents between the UG and the folks that run the Willow Gill Center that have nothing to do with the college. Could you please announce your name so the public sure i'm i'm greg goheen i'm the attorney for the college thank you so my my other part of my question was that i see that now in number 11 the section 11 i'll have to look at but so now i can assume that this property will now go on the tax rolls because it is no longer owned by the unified government and then it's subject to property tax it could also be subject because they are an educational institution. They could also apply for a property tax exemption. I don't know if that's in their intent or not, but because they are an educational institution, they can apply for a property tax exemption. 
Is that the intent? Yes. Yes. No property taxes. Okay. I would encourage us if there's any amendments you would like to have made to talk to Wendy, our legal counsel, for guidance on how to put that proviso forward or that legal uh, uh, amendment to the contract. The fact that we just received this blue sheet and haven't had a chance to review it, I would be remiss to, to take any action on this sheet this evening, and we may want to hold it over till full commission to get a blue sheet with a contractual agreement, a real estate purchase agreement, uh, I, one that would caution us about taking any action until the committee has had a time. Commissioner Davis. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there's still some some questions here. And, and instead of us making a motion at full commission, maybe in the meantime, we can just communicate with legal and get that additional language added. Would hate for there to be, you know, um, an I or whatever, and then it's not very clear. It would be best if it's written down in that both entities are able to look at it, agree to it, and then come back here. That would be my recommendation. Thank you, Chair. So just for clarification, you would just as soon have the language brought for us, uh, brought back to this committee before we approve the, the resolution this evening? If if not, then for full commission for consideration, we can just do that, but not via a motion. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, language in the contract. I I, I would agree with that. And, and this is Wendy with legal. Um, since it has to be blue sheeted to the full commission anyway, there's no reason that we can't get that done and have the full um, the resolution with the changes that you all want as part of the blue sheet as well. Is that satisfactory with the committee? Good. Okay. Great. Okay, we'll, we'll we'll do that. We'll Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Townsend, District One. Uh, we're talking about blue sheeting it to what meeting instead of coming back to EDNF standing committee. The next full commission meeting, I believe, is slated for this Thursday. Okay. Is there any way we council might know how far in advance of Thursday we would see these changes? I hope it's not a three o'clock blue sheet. <laughs> <laughs> Because I would just as soon have it come back as Commissioner Davis suggested to the next month EDNF. This is Wendy with Legal, and I can assure you that as soon as you all give me what language you want in there, it will get done. Same day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have any uh, any other comments from the commission? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk if there are any comments from the public. And I believe I saw Commissioner Bynum stand up. Uh, Commissioner, would you like to address the committee? Uh, Chair Burroughs, thank you very much. I think my concern was entirely about the um, protection of the use of the Willa Gill Center for its current services. And I think Commissioner McKernan has suggested a remedy and that would be contained within the resolution that you will vote on tonight. And then my understanding is that the purchase agreement is a separate document entirely that you will not be voting on tonight, but that could come to full commission on Thursday. Because earlier you had said those types of things tend to be administrative. That was only the lease agreement, not the purchase agreement. I see. So the purchase agreement would come to the full commission right. on Thursday night, but hopefully tonight the language can be amended within a motion to protect the duration of how long Willa Gill can be in the space providing the services that they provide. That's what I was concerned about. Commissioner Biden, we won't be taking any action on an amendment tonight. That amendment will be drafted by, by legal and recommended at Thursday night's meeting Thank along you. with the- and I don't uh, mean amendment. Agreement. That's not the right word. I mean, within the motion that the language is modified tonight to include the protection for the Willigale Center. If, if I understand your question, I want to be clear. Um, there, the committee has agreed to talk to legal about adding some additional language to the resolution that's before us this evening to include some protections for Willa Gill. The long-term, whatever agreement they come to, 
uh, recommendation. That recommendation will then be forwarded along with the purchase agreement to the full commission Thursday evening, if that's my understanding. That's correct. Okay. Okay. I'm good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. I'll ask the clerk if there are any other comments from the public. Oh, Commissioner Davis. I'll just reiterate, um, and I, I'm in favor of uh, there being some sort of relationship or long-term plan for Willa Gill. Um, if it's not going to be at the college, where is it going to be? I think that's for our consideration to figure out. If we do not like this particular language or whatever language is proposed to us, we can always vote it down or send it back to this committee. But I do think this kind of gets at that sweet spot to where both UG and the college can agree on a pathway forward. But it is always all right to say the language does not look correct and we need to go back to the drawing table. Thank you, Chair. Well, as chair, and I've I've taken uh, I've taken the time this evening to let the committee work, trying to guide legal as to what we need to do, but also be mindful that we have a sixty-eight million dollar development project that is also a part of this agreement. So I don't want to lose one for the sake of hypothetically another. So the business before us tonight is the uh, purchase agreement of the property and the will of guilt aspect will be a part of the real estate purchase agreement. So this resolution tonight does not include that presently. So uh, we just want to work on the resolution. Okay, very good. All right. Um, do I have, uh, thank you all recognize any of the public wish to address the committee? Anybody else raising hands online? No hands are raised online. Great, thank you. It does appear David Haley has a question though. Yes, okay. Go ahead, David. Okay, thank you. I uh, I will ask, is there anybody from the audience that wishes to speak in favor of this? Uh, state your name, you have, you'll have three minutes, sir. Levert Murray, Chief Economic Development Advisor, and primarily to address the concern expressed by Commissioner Davis, uh, let me just say that there is a whole staff team, not just folk in the mayor's office, that's assisting, trying to identify locations to relocate the Willa Gill. For example, there is a tour tomorrow of a building, a facility to that could possibly be used for such relocation, and so, and which has been embraced by the county administrator as well. And so, again, I just wanted to point out that with all deliberate speed, you know, these services are being provided to accommodate Willa Gill, but we were all so concerned about having unlimited time to make that happen. So I'm certainly happy that the agreement you're looking at provides uh, for that. So just wanted to say that, that it's not something that's being overlooked. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Any other questions, comment? Senator, oh, I'm sorry, David Haley, you had. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And it's amazing. That was kind of my concern. I remember St. Mary's Kitchen um, when we had many of the services that Willa Gill, and I remember the uh, concern and the appropriation when Willa Gill uh, was constructed. Uh, I think former Senator Dole had a, a large part of that appropriation. And for those services being within the vicinity of where they are now, uh, first with St. Mary's, where we now have, uh, was it the uh, Police Action League? Al is there now uh, in that old building uh, and now made new and now the, the Willa Gill Center and its new use, uh, which will be, I think, for the enhancement of the community as St. Mary's has been if Willa Gill is incorporated into what I consider to be a, a productive, progressive plan that the community college is bringing, um, but where those are, and that is my fundamental concern. I didn't know anything about this sheet, apparently, so neither did anyone else about the uh, ancillary uh, purchase agreement that's before the commission. But as we know, my only bite at the apple is here on EDN at, at the Economic Development Committee. I don't have any real say so before the full commission, but I'm hoping that there will be something firmly in place 
uh, for the very necessary uh, needed services that have been provided by Willa Gill prior to the full commission uh, making a full confirmation of it. And I appreciate the, uh, the questions that have been posed by other members of, of this of this committee, Mr. Chair, uh, as well as uh, by Mr. Murray, the answers that Mr. LeBert Murray gave to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haley. Okay, committee, we have uh, uh, our adoption of a resolution approving a purchase agreement with Kansas City, Kansas Community College for real property located at 600 and 645 Nebraska. It's time to entertain a motion. Davis moved to approve. McKiernan, second. We have a motion and a second for approval. I'd ask clerk, please call roll. Roll call. Haley? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Question. Townsend. Go ahead, Commissioner Townsend. Oh, she has her hand up. I'm sorry. Commissioner Townsend, do you have another question? We're right in the middle of a roll call. Is it a comment that we can make after we take the roll? Well, it's clarity that would impact my vote. As we were discussing, there's going to be a, an addition of language. Is it going to be to this document or to another document? What is the blue sheet language going to address? There's there's no blue sheet language uh, tonight. Uh, right. The, the, the Commissioner That's Townsend, there was a a document that was given to us late in the process this afternoon that is the real estate purchase agreement. And it is uh, roughly, oh, I, I'm going to guess 13 pages in length. Uh, and But we're not voting on it this evening. We're voting on the resolution with the agreement that there may be additional language coming forward on to the full commission that will add the additional language to the resolution not the purchase agreement. Okay, so for clarification, I think we it, the the motion seems to ask us to adopt this yes or no as it currently reads. That was my concern. It, it does. That's exactly what the motion does. Uh, legal will bring forward the new motion or the new resolution as a, with a suggested amendment for full approval of the entire commission Thursday. If you don't want to vote for this resolution without the language in it, I think that's what you're asking me now. That would be on you. That may be the prudent thing for you to do. Okay. Um, I, I think, let me make it clear that I am favoring the sale. However, with the last 20 or 30 minutes worth of discussion, about the language to this resolution that's going to be added since the motion does not reference that my vote would be no on that basis. Okay, thank you. Okay. Wendy, please. If there is a concern, um, since we haven't reached a full vote yet, at this time, Commissioner Davis could- I will do that. Request to I'll amend his motion. My, I'll reset, reset my motion. Thank you. And also, I would include that if it's to be fast tracked, you also might want to include that in your motion as well. All right. It has to be approved by the second. I will withdraw my second. All right. Okay. So we. I'll make another motion. Move to approve with the understanding that staff will add language that will solidify the uh, indefinite and so far undetermined amount by which Willa Gill and the other service providers will operate out of uh, 645 Nebraska, and that this item be fast-tracked to the August 17th full commission meeting. Second. Commissioner Townsend, that address your concerns? I love working with these gentlemen. Thank you, it does. And thank you, Counselor. We have to stay together, thank you. Love clarity. Thank you. This goes to show everyone pays attention. Uh, Commissioner Stites. Before we take roll call, is the appropriate time to ask a follow-up question or anything? Please do so before so, we start. Um, so it sounds like from comments from the public that there sounds like it's currently in discussion to try to find a location for Willow Gill now, quickly, right? Which I'm, I'm not sure about, but I would assume 
that that relocation is going to come at the expense of the unified government, a new location. We are going to foot that bill for a new location for Willow Gill. I bet it's there's not anyone out there that's going to donate as a facility that's going to allow the services for Willow Gill. So again, this is another expense that the unified government property owner, we're going to be getting into us purchasing another piece of property as we are looking at uh, our current budgets right now that are that are uh, out of control. Now we're looking at probably going and purchasing another building. That's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Any other comments or concerns? Okay, Commissioner McKernan. Commissioner Stites, I pre completely appreciate where you're coming from on that. And what I would say is that I think it would be fine if we were to consider the possibility of an acquisition, knowing full well that we don't have to execute that acquisition, that we can keep this resolution and this purchase agreement as codified at a future meeting in place indefinitely. Commissioner Townsend, you had your hand up. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Townsend, District 1. Well, uh, as Commissioner McKiernan says, and this goes to my point too, um, this has been going on for a while, trying to find uh, a, an appropriate location for these services, which makes it all the more important to do as we've already been discussing about leaving Willie Gilla there in the community in which it's been as an integral part of the university, which has come to this area. So it just goes to that as, as Commissioner McKiernan pointed out, you know, we don't have to um, be a part of any purchase that we do not agree on. I love Commissioner Stites' eye on the dollar. I agree with that, but I think this underscores the importance of allowing Willa Gill to provide the services that it has for so many years where it is. Thank you. Okay. I'll entertain a motion. Yeah. We have a motion okay. and a second. Paper. Motion and a second. Okay. I grow concerned that we've just made this about Willa Gill and haven't made it about the resolution itself. Uh, as your chair, I, I, I feel that that discussion has gotten a little off track as to what our priorities are here tonight, and that's to pass a resolution. I understand that Willa Gill is an aspect of this, but it does throw a shadow or some shade onto the resolution moving forward to the full commission that as your chair, I wanna be able to walk in and either support and speak in support of a resolution. However, I'm concerned about the impact Willa Gill may have on a 60 some million dollar development without community's input. So I just wanna have that for full, full clarity, not knowing what the amendment is going to be. If we're willing to lose a $68 million investment for downtown, that is something we should consider here. But this is about passing a resolution on the property to the community college. And so I just want to make sure that we understand exactly what it is. And it's not about the Willa Gill protection, it's about the purchase agreement, or it's about the uh, uh, resolution for the community college. I just wanna make sure that the public is clear, that commissioners are clear, and that the community college is clear as your chair. I'm trying to keep the subject matter focused on what is before us this evening. Okay. Yeah, we, we have a motion and a second. Clerk, please call roll. Can we restate okay. the motion, please? I mean, I mean, because it was it did change. Is that possible, Mr. Okay. Chair? Because uh, it was changed, it was amended. Commissioner Davis, you restate the motion. All right. Move to approve uh, the resolution with the understanding that staff will bring back a uh, resolution to full commission. Uh, that has language that provides protections that is uh, undefined and indefinite for Willa Gill and the other service providers. In addition, that this item be fast-tracked to the August 17th full commission meeting. And the second, Bruce? Absolutely. Okay, second. Okay. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Hands, none? Clerk, please call roll. 
Roll call. Haley? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Commissioner Townsend? Aye. Stites? McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, committee. Thank you, Dr. Moser. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Committee, while we're waiting, item number two, uh, you should have uh, some information before you here. It's a black and white document in reference to our next uh, point of order here. So then we'll move on to our third and final item, which is the blue sheeted item that came forward tonight. Good news coming on. <laughs> it is. It's not too bad. It's really good. <laughs> Okay, our next to the last item, and this one is for information only, is to uh, is about the uh, second quarter 2023 investment report. And we're fortunate enough to have the two ladies responsible for that this evening. I'll recognize Andrea Vineyard for comments, and we have Debbie Johnson, our uh, CFO. Interim CFO. Yeah, I'll let you say that. <laughs> Please, ladies. Every time does it to me. <laughs> uh, Andrew Vineyard. So I cash manager, deputy treasurer. Thanks for having me this evening. I'll make it as quick as I can. I'm pretty good at that. Um, this is going to be our investment portfolio report for quarter two, which would end June 30, 2023. Um, few metrics I want to point out, first of which the average yield shows is 3.28%, holding strong, but going to show down. We've got days to maturity that did go down. Um, we were at 274 days in quarter one, which reflected some maturities that happened then dropping it down to now where we sit is 231 days. Um, portfolio as a whole sitting at 64% in cash. And then we have 36% invested between certificate of deposit and then federal agencies. As alluded to on the first slide, our average yield shown on the graph here was at 3.28 which is up from quarter one, which was 3.16%. Still holding strong below the target T-bill rate, which is what we want to see every quarter, which has hit a high for my tenure, 5.42%. That's um, good for now. Um, interest earned total, we're at sitting at 3 million for the year, um, bringing in 1.9 million in interest for quarter two, bringing to the total of 3 million for the whole year so far in interest for our portfolio. Um, next, I want to kind of go over the portfolio as an issuer as a whole, holding a little bit of property tax, part of the procedure and process, about $2 million there that we had not distributed yet, moving into a next distribution here in September. Um, of the total amount, we're at $90 million in investments. And then we have, that would be the CDs between now two different institutions, Commerce Bank and UMB. And then we have a couple of treasuries that we'll be holding on to, which is about 8% or $27 million. No activity in quarter two, um, mainly focusing on watching the portfolio strongly, watching the, the, um, the rates, kind of all we were really focused on here moving into quarter three. So obviously we did not go out for bid, nor did we have anything mature. Um, I did want to point out that we are going through the process of recertifying all of the institutions locally here at the county, city of Bonner Springs, Edwardsville, along with KCK to allow for new or, you know, investors that had not been interested last year. We're finalizing that all. The deadline was Friday the 11th. Um, I have 10 solidified already with three I'm still waiting on. Um, and I am more than happy to allow them to come in, even if the deadline is passed, you know, business needs. Um, I want to get as many on that list as we can. So we are working through that process now with the idea of potentially doing some investing this next quarter once we review the portfolio a little bit stronger and including that new group of investors. <laughs> Just 
just have one more. <laughs> Can't get to it. No. <laughs> My hands are off. <laughs> you're, you're wanting to do the category cash balances? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I should be at one more to, yeah, it should be the last one. If you can't find it, you you could feel more than half, feel more free to go ahead and read it. You have it in front of you. My apologies, I'm not sure. Okay. Would you like a copy? I have one. Okay. I just didn't. I don't. Not sure why it's and, not. And up we there. have a copy. It's for information only. So yeah, definitely. Uh, just real quick, where our cash fund balances are, we're sitting at 26 percent in bond documents for the capital projects, 27 percent in the general fund, which is shown to be combined for reserve, liquidity needs, emergencies, budgetary. And then we have 20% in the enterprise funds, 26% in a combination of state statute for functions like the special revenues, grant tax levies, and internal fund, and a 1% for that semi-annual debt service payment that we make. With that, that would be my presentation this evening. Well, I, I want to echo one of my colleagues that this was uh, good news. I mean, anytime we see $3 million coming into uh, from investment portfolio, that's, that's a welcome after the... What, historic lows and or no interest? Yeah, it's been tricky, but we're watching it. Um, many ideas, the, the rates are going very high. Um, our overnights hit the highest in my nine years doing this. So it's interesting to see that, but also continuing to watch. We are speaking with um, Baker Tilly residually to make sure that we're following everything we want to be doing there and having you know outside perspective as well. Well, I know we've had a talk in the past, Andrea, in reference to one of our policies that says we can't go over 25% in one particular institution. Correct. However, we don't want to lose our margin uh, because of that policy. So there is some risk there, right. but it's yeah, minimal it. risk. The return has to be greater than the risk. Correct. So, okay. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Seeing none. Ladies, thank you. Thank you very thank you. much. Bit of good news. Especially going into the budget. Yeah. And I'll ask the clerk, is there any comments from the public? No comments were received and there's no hands raised. Okay, wonderful. Anyone in the audience wish to speak? Okay, seeing none, let the record show none step forward. Committee, we were blue sheeted tonight with a third option. Uh, so this, uh, this is a resolution, and this is an action item by my agenda. So uh, we'll wait for the our parties to get seated. Our last item this evening is the adoption of a resolution approving the issuance of IRBs in an amount not to exceed 250 million to finance the cost of construction equipment for the benefit of the American Royal Association. This item is also being requested to be fast tracked to Thursday night meeting of this week. And I and Noah says it, Jeff Conway, but I believe Wendy Green is going to be giving the overview. Actually, Wendy Green is going to be handing it off to Todd Lasala to give the overview. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I don't quite see the really don't slide. Well, let me clue you in as to why, and then Ron will see if I can help you. But I'll show you where it's off the slide. Okay. Okay. So you knew you knew this was coming. Okay. All right, uh, welcome. He's he's going to read it and interpret it for me. I guess I'll take paper since I can't have a PDF. Oh, we've got one right here. It's coming. Well, I've got I've got the blue shirt. Oh, this piece. Oh, thank you. Holy moly. Okay. Oh, 
But I do apologize. We had to switch to paper. We were prepared to do it on the screen. So, but uh, apparently that's not available. Okay, if we go down the row and introduce ourselves so we know who we have with this evening and speak up and loud enough so we can hear. Sure, Kevin Lee with the Polsonelli Law Firm. Kevin Lee with the Polsonelli Law Firm, legal counsel to the applicant developer. Jackie McClaskey, president and CEO of the American Royal. Todd LaSala from Stinson, outside counsel. Kevin Wimpy from Gilmore and Bell, the UG's bond counsel. Well, welcome. Who's going to do the honors? Who's got the honors? I think the developer will start and then Kevin and I will come in behind. Okay. So, Commissioner, we have been asked to start off with giving an overview of the American Royal Project. I've been working on the American Royal Project as an employee of the American Royal since 2019. Um, for four years before that, I was working on this project from the state of Kansas. So, in total, have been working on this project for eight years. And if you haven't driven by the property, there was no one happier than me on March 17th to stand in the snow and let us and show us finally moving dirt. So we're excited that the American Royal is taking place. For those of you who followed the project for a long time, you know that we went through the final development plan process and we're preparing to turn dirt in 2020. Um, obviously, 2020 was not the right time to move forward with a project that was focused on bringing a lot of people together and putting them under one roof. So we paused the project. The thing that I want to share with you the, um, tonight about pausing that project that we think is very important is the idea that during that time, um, we spent a lot of time researching other facilities and really believe that today we are offering a plan, the plan we put through for the final development plan that is a better facility and will more um, effectively allow us to hold the events we want to hold here in Wyandotte County. In addition to that, it also gave us the time to really step back and ask the question of what what do we want to be? Who are we? What is the American Royal? So if you look at the first three pages of your um, handouts, these walk, walk you through the key components of our strategic plan. We um, redefine our purpose, our mission, and our vision. And our mission, I think, is something that's going to be really important to the people of Wyandotte County. It's to be the nation's leader for food and agricultural education events and engagement. And by focusing on that mission and focusing on our purpose to champion food and agriculture, it really gives us the opportunity to make a difference in the world in regard to food and ag. Um, the next page goes through our guiding principles. I won't go through those in great detail, but it tells you where we focus. And the next page is our strategic objectives. So if you're not familiar with the American Royal and what we do, these six objectives really lay it out for you. First and foremost, we produce high quality agricultural events and experiences. We do that at the same time we're educating both intentional and unintentional learner, learners by delivering agricultural discovery, learning, and engagement. We also know that there is a great need to um, encourage young people to, to choose the food and agricultural industry. And we believe that the youth of Kansas City, as well as youth who come to our event facilities from over 46 states today, um, need to be inspired and we need to develop talent for the food and ag industry. None of this do we think we can do in our current home all of which has led us to the desire to build the nation's premier agricultural event entertainment engagement campus that will allow us to be able to lead and influence agriculture, all of which we intend to do while being a high performance organization. Um, many people think about the American Royal and think about one event. You think about barbecue, or you think about rodeo, or you think about livestock shows, or you think about horse shows. The next page just gives you an idea of, in this current year, the number of American Royal events that we are doing. And we think that it's giving you the chance to see that is important. But what's exciting, as you look past the next two slides, the next one's just meant to, to give you a, a vision of the future. Well, I'm actually, I lied. I'm going to come back to that other slide, but hold that thought of the current events in there. As you look, as you continue to flip through the slides, you're going to see our location map. I think most of you know where our location is, but just in case you don't, this shows you exactly. The area outlined in red is what we call phase, phase one of the project. This sort of orange block to the left will be phase two. As you flip to the next page of the site plan that shows both the current phase and the future phase, it identifies everything we're building under our current project, as well as our intent to build 120 plus acre festival grounds um, next to us. The next piece of the site plan lays out exactly what is in our final development plan. We have a barn that is the equivalent of 6.9 football fields, all under one roof. 
um, that will allow us to hold the kind of events we need to hold to be a regional and national leader in food and agricultural events. It's a three arena, um, three arenas that are connected to each other. One that we can consider our main event arena, shown on your map as Arena A, a multi-purpose arena shown as Arena B, and an outdoor arena. You can move from one arena into the others, and so they can all be put together as one big event, or um, we can separate those and hold different events in each of those spaces. Primary to the American Royal Mission, you will see to the north, the Learning and Engagement Center, which is about 80,000 square feet of learning space that also will provide high quality meeting space um, that we anticipate many people in the region will be interested in using. And then in addition, we always, you know, you can't do anything like this without offices and storage and maintenance shops, all of which are also shown on the map. As you continue to flip through, you see a bigger picture of the barn. In this case, you see what it looks like to have 10 by 10 horse stalls within that barn and how many that actually is, allowing us to have 1,500 usable horse stalls in the area and to be able to unload over 80 trucks and trailers at the same time. And if you've ever had the joy of being caught on the interstate when we are in loading and unloading days at the American Royal, you'll know how important it is that we have that kind of that structure. The next page shows you the arena plans and how they all connect, as I mentioned earlier, and how that Ed Center um, works right into them. The next page just shows you a greater, um, a little bit greater detail, hard to see on these for sure, um, of the Education Center or the Learning and Engagement Center. Um, which has everything from an auditorium that can also be used as an auction ring to a VIP space that you can actually see into the arenas from providing a really unique experience during our events. When it comes down to it, there will be education around every corner in the barns, in the arenas, in the education center itself, because that really is key to our overall mission. We want everyone who shows up on site, whether they're for a livestock event or a basketball tournament, to learn something about food and agriculture, our nation's largest industry. And now you get to see the additional events, events that we would plan to add. This just gives you an idea of what a new list of events will look like in the new American Royal. All of these events are things that we can actually imagine branding. And all of these events already exist in our strategic plan, which takes us through 26. So we would imagine many of these things being able to happen by 26. A few probably won't, but our goal is to get as many of these going by 26 as possible. And then, when we start looking at the number of days we use for current events, we expand our branded events, then we talk about hosted events. And we are, our, our phones are ringing constantly of people who are ready to book this space. Um, you know, there's things, there's groups we've been talking to for a long time, like National High School Rodeo Associations. Um, we've been, we're talking to all the breed associations that hold large junior national shows in the summer, we're talking to other short, horse shows, other cattle shows, but more important, not more importantly, but in addition to that, we're getting things we never thought of. Um, we had a call the other day from a group that wants to have a, a rabbit show that would put 2,000 rabbits in our facility or a hog show that would put potentially 4,000 hogs in our facility, which are just crazy numbers, And but we're building a facility that will allow us to do that. Um, so as you think about that and you think about what that means, um, we are right now drawing 390,000 people to the American Royal limited to our 100-day calendar. As we start to expand that calendar, add, expand our existing events, add new events, you're looking at over 1 million visitors a year um, within the first five years of operation. And we believe that by the 20th year of operation in that first 20 years, we'll average over 2 million visitors per year. So we're very excited about what we can do and what we're bringing to the area. As you look through the rest of the slides, I'll just let you flip th through those on your own. But those are designed to just let you see a little bit about what the facility is going to look like. Um, right now, it looks like a lot of dirt, but there's a lot of exciting things coming. So that gives you an update on the project. I think I will turn it over to Kevin to talk about what we're doing here tonight specifically. Yeah, thank you all. Um, really, the reason giving rise to the request this evening is, is the IRB request. It's currently contemplated under the existing development agreement that we have out there from back in 2017 and then updated in 2018. Um, and I'm sure that Todd will, will tell you some more about this as well. But as we got further into actually commencing construction and, and looking at um, sales tax exemption, and is that something that we are by right, um, already entitled to as the American Royal Association, or is that something that we need to go and pursue IRBs for? Um, we, we are now back before you because the existing development agreement does contemplate that situation, um, getting sales tax exemption on construction materials through that. And so we submitted an application back at the end of June. Um, I think there was a, a miscommunication is what I'll call it between um, your staff and ours to where we thought we were on this committee regular 
um, without having to blue sheet. And then in the last couple of weeks have been scrambling and working with, with your staff um, and, and legal counsel to uh, come to a place that we could get on this agenda. And so um, the request of us was that we give an overall project update, knowing that we'll be back before you in the near future here with a, a larger um, amendment to the framework of the development agreement. I think the project, as you heard from Jackie, the core components of it are, are largely unchanged. We think it's a better, more purpose-built um, design now, um, but we will be back before you just with the time that's passed and bringing that current. And so uh, they wanted a, a larger global update in connection with this request. Sure, and, and I'll, I'll pick up from there. And again, this is Kevin Wimpy uh, the, with the UG's Bond Council from Gilmore Bell. Um, so as, as the applicant stated, again, the, the most urgent part of their incentive uh, request here on, under their application is the, the sales tax exemption on construction materials, which as this group knows is granted by approval of a resolution of intent uh, by the commission. And that, that allows the developer to access the, the sales tax exemption certificate from the state. Uh, and also as that, uh, daylighted by the applicant, there is, uh, you know, we do foresee re-engaging on the broader development agreement, making the necessary tweaks and so forth to get the broader package together. But again, this is why this uh, request takes the lead in, in that series of events. And in, in recognition of that, um, this resolution contains a few uh, unique and specific uh, attributes compared to what you'd normally consider for a sales tax exemption. Uh, in section 10 that calls out that if certain milestones uh, along the way of considering a broader development agreement aren't accomplished by in the first quarter of next year, uh, there'd be clawback of these incentives and repayment of any sales tax foregone uh, by virtue of the, the IRBs. And so it really uh, is just in recognition again that this is being considered before we dive into the, the broader details. Right. Tom LaSalle, I, I would only add that those items I think are in recognition of the fact that there's a bunch of work to do. This development agreement um, was originally entered in 2017, which is a long time ago. Project has evolved a long way since then. Uh, Kevin is right. The industrial revenue bond financing that's contemplated here really for purposes of sales tax exemption only, uh, not for tax abate, property tax abatement, it was always there. But among other things, it contemplates that that was to happen within three years after we signed that agreement in 2017, unless you otherwise agree. So here we are. Um, there's a lot of activity out there. makes good sense that they want to do that first. Uh, some of the communication about this, uh, the request from the UG about communication was about the evolution of the project. Not only the change in the plan, but the change in the budget and the incentives and the timing and so forth. Um, I think I think the county administrator and the staff were hoping for a big picture about what the development agreement would look like, how we would amend the project plan, and a time frame on getting started with um, with the feasibility study that we necessarily need to do. Because you'll remember this development agreement is star bonds, CID, and this industrial revenue bond piece, which is the smallest piece of the three. So that's the context. That's why we're here tonight. The limited item in front of you tonight is just this resolution of intent, uh, which would allow the developer to go get a project exemption certificate and therefore an abatement on the sales tax on the construction materials and the, and the labor going forward. They will also, if we didn't already say so, uh, they are also asking to fast track this item from tonight um, to the full commission meeting on Thursday night, the 17th. So that's the full request. We're happy to answer any questions. Committee questions? Commissioner McKernan. Thank you. Um, I've supported this project from the very beginning. I voted affirmatively to move it forward at, from the very beginning, but wow. So, Mr. LaSala. Yes. Help me feel good again tonight, like you've done before. Currently, the UG has about $598 million of IRB that we have issued not responsible for. And that's one of the things I want you to help me understand that we're not on the hook for any of this, yeah. but this 250 million would be almost 50% again, what we already have issued. It's a large amount of money. And I just want to have peace of mind 
that issuing these IRBs will in no way negatively impact the unified government nor its credit rating. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can make you feel good about that. It, the, these are very different than other bonds that you issue, special obligation bonds. Uh, these bonds are really for the sole purpose of going to get that sales tax exemption, uh, sole purpose. So there is, I mean, Kevin can elaborate here. Um, there, there, there really is no impact to your credit rating. There is no risk to the UG. Um, it is a mechanical tool provided by the statute that gives the developer the opportunity to get this project exemption certificate and abate sales taxes on construction materials. That's it. You just touched on the second point. I want to make sure that I'm just clear yep. that we are under no obligation for the repayment of these bonds as the issuer. None whatsoever. Thank you, Mr. LaSalle. I appreciate it. And Commissioner, I'll just add that absolutely these are anticipated to be the buy your own bonds deal where the developer's purchasing its own bond solely responsible for repayment. And also that the IRB statute actually prohibits pledging the full faith and credit of the unified government for repayment of these types of bonds. What is the projected cost of the project? Right now, the overall project cost is $350 million with about 300 million of that being related to construction. The other 50 million is everything that includes our land purchase to um, educational exhibits and costs we've been accruing since 2015, to be perfectly honest. And then um, the 300 million, when it, I, I don't know that I have that breakdown in front of me of what it is of actual construction costs versus fees and all the other components that are in it. We have basically at this point, we have taken this project, we have reduced, um, we have reduced the, um, the cost of the project through value engineering to make it about a 35% increase of where we were in 2020. So we're feeling pretty good about that. It's just a lot more money than any of us ever in, in, intended this project to be. Commissioner Townsend. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, um, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Townsend, District 1, good evening to every one of the presenters present. Uh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Commissioner McKiernan, did you say that already we had approved something like $598 million in this project on IRBs? No, 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 not, in, not oh. in this project at all. That was other IRBs that the unified government has issued for a whole continuum of other projects. Oh, got it. Not not this particular one. Okay. Uh, is this the first request then for IRBs for um, the Royal Project, American Royal Project? Commissioner, this is Todd LaSala. In, in a sense, it is, it's the first time they've asked for a resolution of intent to proceed. It was always a part of the development agreement all the way back to 2017. Okay. But I mean, are, have we already approved a prior request for IRBs for the American Royal? No. Okay. Well, then I don't have to ask my second question <laughs> about um, needing this for sales tax exemption uh, because there were no previous requests as this one, correct? That's correct. We have they have oh. never asked for a resolution of intent to issue IRB. We have not done any IRBs for this project. Okay. Thank you. And I did look through the resolution. I'm always looking for uh, a section six, which talks about um, the unified government's obligations as the issuer on that, uh, echoing what uh, Commissioner McKiernan, the concerns he raised. I'm always looking for that. So I've seen it and that's my understanding. We are not on the hook uh, yeah. for this. And unfortunately, I do not have before me the, the printout, I guess, that Ms. McCluskey, forgive me if I didn't get your name correctly, um, presented. So I don't have that list. But what occurred to me is, will this enhanced version of the size and scope of the American Royal contemplate a group like the Future Farmers of America. That used to be such a boon to Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, and I'm wondering if that's on the list of possibles. 
So I'd be happy to answer that question. The FFA convention has gotten exceptionally large. It's actually one of the largest conventions in the country. And we don't have the hotel capacity in the Kansas City region to compete for it. Right now, it's usually held in either Louisville or in Indianapolis. But if they don't actually downsize it, they're going to push themselves into a choice like Atlanta, San Diego, Las Vegas, not the greatest place to take high school students. I answer the question that way because what we intend to do is work with them on some other opportunities for national conferences for students to attend that would be held here um, at the American Royal. And we also, their uh, 100th anniversary is coming up in um, 2028. So we also imagine having an anniversary event with them. So while we don't believe we will bring the convention back, we believe that we can help them establish other events that um, youth from across the country could attend. Thank you for that update. When I worked uh, downtown years ago, um, they used to call that weekend Black Friday for Kansas City, Missouri, because it brought in so much business and profitability. So um, I was hoping that that might transfer over here, but it sounds like they're already beyond our means to accommodate them. But who knows what the future holds? Thank you very much. Commissioner Davis. Thank you, and it's nice to meet you all. I was not uh, on the commission or on this community in 2017, and so I remember someone asked me about the American Royal, and I was like, the American who? Like, what is that? Um, so I, I quickly had to get uh, caught up to speed. What is you all's, um, and I know timelines change, interest rates, what have you, but but ideally, what is your timeline for the the completion of this project? So it is a big project um, and, you know, it's shocking to most people when I told them we turned art in March that we won't even go vertical until probably November or December. We'll start with the barns and basically move our way north. So the first thing that will be completed is the barn facility that you saw on the outline and it should be done late first quarter of 2025. Um, and the complete project at this point is on schedule to be done in September of 2025. Um, if, for those of you familiar with the American Royal, that's right in the heart of, the, of our biggest part of the season. So whether or not we will move events in 25 or wait till 26 is to be determined and depends on how close we're staying on schedule. Gotcha, gotcha, very, very uh, exciting. Um, the other thing is if uh, legal, if you all could just send me the contract or the development agreement for this, um, that would be great. I know it's been some years back just so I can review it, but um, thank you all so much. I, I'm excited to see this with everything happening in the metro area in FIFA and everything that's happening with the World Cup. I think it would be really cool if we can include this as well uh, within the festivities. But um, yeah, I'm excited for this project. Thank you, Chair. Any other comments? Well, this has been out there for a long time. Ms. McClaskey, as you well know, has seen this thing a number of times and it's just short notice to read through a document. $250 million is, is a lot of money uh, for us to take a bite at the apple in a short amount of time and then fast track something. I, I personally am um, not accustomed to doing that. Um, it's, it's been out here a while. I don't understand the expediency, why it's necessary that we have to fast track it. It hasn't been communicated to me as chair. I don't know if the other commissioners have heard, heard as to why. Uh, maybe legal can express some reasons as to why it needs to be fast tracked after sitting out here for four years. And then tonight we're hit 30 minutes before the meeting with a document and $250 million IRB request. C Commissioner, I, I think I would say to you that this is really about the construction schedule for the American Royal. I actually think the developer is the right person to ask, answer this question because as we talked about nights when it could come forward and so forth, I, I think they're gonna tell you they are really chomping at the bit on construction and ordering materials and moving forward. Uh, I, I think it where we are tonight, it's as much about the construction schedule as anything else. Absolutely, and I think, let me talk you through kind of what our schedule was. Um, the first thing we're doing after dirt work that, that really accumulates significant um, potential sales tax liability is the sewer line that we're putting in. And to be perfectly honest, when we originally came forward, we thought we'd be doing a public sewer line, but we're doing a private sewer line. So we are paying, if you've been out there and seen the five foot tall um, sewer lines, those are 
that's what we're paying for. So those, those bills came forward faster than we anticipated that we were going to be responsible for. So we started having the conversations in June about filing our IRB paperwork. We filed it on June 28th. I had a conversation on July 7th asking for this to be expedited to the August 17th commission meeting. And, and that's where I think some level of miscommunication came from because we didn't get asked for any additional information until August 4th. So if we were to have provided it, that's on me. I'll take that responsibility. But um, so we thought on July 7th that we were good to go to not have to blue sheet this. We still would have asked tonight to expedite it to Thursday, but we wouldn't, we were hoping that it would have been in your agenda and, and all of these things would have been worked out. But literally we were going through when it came to our attention that that the UG wanted requirements about the timing of the development agreement and all of those things. We were working on that over the weekend to get that, that language included. So whatever error we made in not communicating more click, clearly in early July, I will, I will take that. But the reason that we were, that even at that point, I was expediting, asking for ex, an expedited approach to this between this meeting and Thursday's meeting was because of the construction schedule and the fact that we would like to place orders um, for things like steel um, very quickly because the, um, the time to wait for things like to, to place our order to get in, we have to be six, basically six months ahead of time. So our steel order is, is setting and waiting um, for us to be able to, to place that order. Well, I can appreciate that is $250 million as is stated. We have 500 and some million already out in, in, in IRBs that, that we've issued. And now 250 million more. That's just shy of three quarters of a billion dollars that uh, unified government's credit risk uh, is, is, is out there. Should there be a default, it's going to come back on the proprietors, but our reputation is tied to those risks. Kevin might want to speak to this as well. I, Commissioner, with great respect, and I do appreciate the conservative nature. We have talked about this so much on other things. In this arena with industrial revenue bonds, it's just not the credit risk. It is not, the market is not watching these. These are bonds bought by the developer themselves. They're not sold out there publicly, and the rating agencies are not watching these. It is a different with great respect, it's a very different risk profile than what we're talking about when we go issue the star bonds right. and sell those publicly or go issue CID bonds for home field or other things. It's just, it is just not the, the it's not the same ballpark. It's not the same sport. Well, and, and I understand that Todd, the, um, and I, I've read through this as quickly. I'd like to take some time to read through it. I'm looking at section nine and section 10 in reference to the, the resolution. The, the 250 million to pay for construction and make orders, I don't look at 250 million dollars as the amount of money in sales tax that you're going to be saving. I mean, why 250? Is it to cover the entire project? I mean, you haven't even, a, if you've applied for star bonds, or, or is a star bonds request going to be less now because of the IRBs? I'm just trying to get a, get a, a figure here as to how we as uh, commissioners have a comfort level of giving $250 million in IRBs out in addition to additional 500 more. That's the public doesn't understand. It has a difficult time understanding the financial aspect of these contract agreements. And if there's going to be a property tax exemption, if there's going to be requests for a pilot, if there's going to be additional requests coming forward, in addition to star bonds requests, we need some solidification of some sort financially for this community to know that we're on good graces with, with this project. It's been four years and all of a sudden earth's moving pretty quickly out there. And then we're hit tonight with 250 million IRB and the public should have been able to see the plan. I, I know it's short notice. And then to fast track it, uh, that's, it just raises flags for me personally. I don't operate that way, uh, but it's, it, the committee will take its action accordingly. But I just want to do what I can to guide the committee forward with this uh, motion. Yeah. C Commissioner, just a couple of things in what you just said. I, one, no tax abatement, no property tax abatement. Um, for not ad valorem property tax abatement, no pilot. That's not part of the equation here at all. 
just sales taxes on the construction materials, the equipment, the labor. Uh, two, the general picture for financing for this project, it's been a long time, but the big picture here was about $80 million of star bonds and community improvement district um, proceeds. That it was $80 million of those two things combined. That was the financing package. That plus IRBs for this purpose. Um, in our discussion, in our very healthy, detailed discussions with the developer of late about the big picture and the evolution of the project, it is our understanding that that is still the program. I, the, those may not still be the numbers, the budgets are evolving and changing, but conceptually, those are the same tools that we've been talking about. And I don't think that that is evolving. Uh, Kevin, any other piece of this that you want to take? Yeah, sure, Mr. Chairman. Real quickly, uh, back to your comment about financing and how the star bonds and IRBs play together. So uh, Todd mentioned it's separate ago. It's a different ball field between star bonds financing project costs versus IRBs. And, and as he said, I think of the IRBs purchased by the developer as more of a, a vehicle for granting the incentive of sales tax exemption rather than a true method to finance the costs. So the, the developer in this case will go privately finance all their project costs. And then uh, most typically the IRBs are issued near substantial completion and again are purchased by the developer uh, to, to reimburse themselves for the costs for which they need the IRBs. And the costs for which they need the IRBs are those that uh, absent other exemption sales tax would apply. And so I think I heard 350 million total costs or something in that ballpark. And the, the request for IRBs in front of you is for 250 million. And the applicant might add additional uh, context here, but my guess is the exemptions existing in that 100 million negative space that's not requested with the IRBs includes labor and land costs. And those are otherwise exempt uh, under separate statute for new construction projects meaning the, the 250 million really applies towards labor, furniture, fixtures, and equipment and, and other materials contained in the project that again, they'll privately finance, but need the IRB, uh, IRB approval to forego paying sales tax on those costs. But if I remember correctly, that's what Star Bonds pays for. Star Bonds pays for infrastructure. You stated you were gonna build your own private sewer system, but yet Star Bonds pays for that infrastructure. Right. Star Bonds pays for everything but vertical construction. It pays for uh, water, sewer lines, roadway, sidewalks, all the signage, everything else. And yet we still got a $250 million request for sales tax for construction costs. I'm just trying to understand the financial picture of, of what we're looking at here. But don't, I, again, with great respect, don't think of it as 250 on top of the $80 million. It's not, it's not like that. It's the developer purchasing things with the bonds that they bought themselves. It is really a pass-through vehicle between them and the and the bonds. It is not and it is not additional money coming into the project where the UG has has issued eight. if the if the number winds up being 80 million, it's not like you're gonna you're, we're gonna go publicly sell and give the developer 80 million dollars of star bonds and then there's 250 million dollars of new money that comes in from someplace else. It's their money. So, and I know it's a really confusing vehicle and I don't, I don't know if Kevin and I are doing a good job of explaining it, but, it, but we should not think of it as new money coming in from someplace else or new money that the developer is giving, or that we're giving to the developer. That $250 million is a function of their construction costs and using this vehicle solely for purposes of getting that sales tax exemption. Thank you. Commissioner Davis? Um, I actually understand what you're saying, um, but uh, would it be fair for this? I'm thinking of like a coupon or like a certificate where it's not necessarily that company that is purchasing that, but it is saying it makes it more affordable in some way, shape or form to purchase whatever. I'm still liable, right? But if I use that coupon or that discount, would that be a comparable comparison here? in some way. Yeah, in some way. In some ways I think so. It actually the fact that you call it a certificate it I know, I know it, it really is. no it really actually is so spot on because the whole point of this exercise like if the legislature would would say that without issuing industrial revenue bonds we could just 
grant them the project exemption certificate that they're really looking for, this would be a lot simpler. Gotcha. But I, right. I mean, if, if, but for the fact that the legislature requires this vehicle and the issuance of bonds and this month, their money flowing through the bonds to pay their own construction costs, but for that requirement of the legislature, if it just said we could go give them a project exemption certificate to abate that sales tax, that's what we would do. Gotcha. So yeah, that that's colleagues. That's how I look at this is a, a coupon that would basically say you do not have to pay sales tax for what you're purchasing. I, I think it's a fair way to look at it. And I, I would only add, I think everything that Todd and Kevin said is, is spot on. It's 250 million does seem like a staggering number. The, the intent behind that is a not to exceed amount that's large enough to include all purchases that would be subject to sales tax potentially. So when we're talking about the actual amount of sales tax savings that's projected from that, it would be something substantially lower, you know, take 10%. Overall sales tax rate as as rough figures to to multiply it by that. If we were to issue all 250 million, you'd have the 25 million of, of savings would be total. So we're expecting something much less than that. It's not actual money out. There's no dollars that change hands other than issuance costs paid at at closing of those IRBs. So it is a large number, but it's 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 not. Um, it really is is not to be viewed the same as as star bonds. They're just different uh, mechanisms, and it's not a true financing tool. Mr. Klasky, any final words? No. Thank you for your patience with me, with Kevin and I. I, you know, I it's, it's difficult to explain. I fear we didn't do it very well, but we appreciate your patience with us. I do have a couple of things I just want to say. Again, I want to apologize. If there was something we should have done earlier, we would have happily, happily done it. We were waiting for the project cost to get pretty close um, to where we where we felt like we knew where we were going to be. And then um, the second piece of that is we wanted to get started. So it has been a long wait. And once we started, we really could dive in and say, this is the project, this is our cost. Um, we started this paperwork as soon as we really could. So I apologize that we didn't get this to you earlier. We do intend to be back to talk about our Starbond package. The Starbond package is, uh, as we've talked about now, six going on, soon to be seven years old. Um, the project costs have expanded substantially. So I just, I do want to be upfront and honest with you all that we will be working with the team to, to look at that development agreement and working with the state on the overall project agreement. And, and our goal, we said we agreed to be, have to be done by the first quarter, but we'd really like to get it all done in 2023 if we, if we possibly can. So you're hopefully, hopefully going to see us a few times in the next few months. Commissioner Stites. Stites, District 7. So um, here, here, all the buzz out there right now is American Royal. I, I, that's my district. I drive up and down there all the time. And there are uh, folks out there that are excited. There's groups that I'm involved with that keep saying, man, it's finally happening. We're excited for the American Royal. Look at look at the equipment. Go to social media. Look at it. You'll see it. You know, um, everyone is excited about this. This $250,000 million, it's not our money. It's not money that we would ever get. It's the, it's the developer's money. There's no risk to the unified government. It's just a tool that allows them, at, last, at least what the what I know of, you're probably not going to order your steel uh, uh, vertical material from any business here in, in Wyandotte County. So um, it, it, it's monies that, that um, uh, people that are outside of Wyandotte County, right? So this is just a tool. It's really, and Kevin, I think that, uh, and I think you did a great job, Todd. Um, I understand it completely, but uh, the um, you're, you're pre-authorized Really, that's what it is. You're pre-approved to $250 million. That, that's, that's really what it is, not to exceed. Um, it's, it's very clear with all that being said, I'm excited. Um, I, I, look, I look forward to all of the things that uh, are on the horizon. We've, we've heard about this for years, right? And I'm not saying that to, to, be, um, uh, to be negative, right? It's, it's, it's the right time now, right? Other times, it wasn't the right time, apparently. We went through COVID. It wasn't right. It just did, stars didn't line up. We're there now. There's a lot of things happening out in Western Wyandotte County that's also going to help benefit downtown Wyandotte County also, east of 635. I, I, I know that there's a lot of different things. I've been to several meetings um, and that where you look to expand uh, the education process, things that are happening in agricultural, the food, um, and, and I, I think this is a, a, 
a great project. With all that being said, I make a motion to approve uh, the issuance of IRBs not to for the uh, for the um, amount not to exceed two hundred and fifty million dollars, and to fast track this for our next commission meeting, which would be on August seventeenth. Avery second. I'll ask the clerk. Is there any body any any comments from the commission? Any other comments? No, com no written comments received. No hands are raised online. I'm sorry, no hands online? No hands raised online. Okay, uh, recognize anybody in the public who cares to speak on the issue? Okay, let the record show nobody step forward. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve $250,000 in IRB. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Oh, I'm sorry, it's out. <laughs> yeah, 250 million. Thank you for that. Okay, clerk, please call roll. Roll call. Haley? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Stites? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. And please know that I, the apology is accepted. Ish, we have what we call on threes for educational purposes. We have a public, when you hear $250 million granted by the UG going through budget, it, we're the ones that bear the brunt of that. We understand the IRB process. We understand star bonds. They understand $250 million is going to somebody. And that's the concern that I as chairman want to ensure that my committee understands and that the public understands. So uh, thank you. Committee, that's, that's the end of our work this evening. Uh, appreciate your patience. Council, thank you. Uh, with that, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion Davis. to adjourn. Davis second. There's a motion and a second. Clerk, please call roll. Roll call. Haley? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Stites? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. So that we can, yes, so that we can let um, people trade places and get ready for our next standing committee meeting, let's plan to convene neighborhood and community development at 7 o'clock. I just know how much we bought over the home field, yeah. 100 million, and now we're 250 million. Nobody blinks an eye. And this one was fast track. I mean, I understand it, but the public doesn't. And, and so if fast tracking is going to be acceptable, you know, for that kind of money.
second is we have a lot of hands. Not going now. You're not going. All right, we'll ask everyone if they could please take their seats and get ready for our second committee meeting of the evening. All right, we'll thank everyone for attending this evening. And before I call this meeting to order, I do want to announce that some committee members, staff and public are attending remotely via Zoom, in addition to those of us who are on site. We ask that all participants who are joining by phone or by Zoom mute their phones or their devices when not speaking to avoid background noise. When speaking, please speak directly into a microphone to ensure that everyone listening is able to hear your comments and to ensure that we have a clear record. During the meeting, please make sure that you announce yourself by name and title every time you speak so the public that is observing knows who is speaking. This is critical given the number of remote participants and is still current guidance from the Kansas Attorney General. The public is allowed to participate and to offer comment on items before this committee tonight. They can do that by sending a, um, an email prior to the meeting to the clerk's office or by participating by Zoom or by offering comment here in the fifth floor conference room. With that, I will call the meeting of the Neighborhood and Community Development Standing Committee to order and ask for roll call, please. Roll call, Bynum. Here. Stites. Here. Davis? Here. Townsend? Present. Burroughs? Here. McKiernan? Here. We have no revisions to the agenda as originally published, and my understanding is there are no committee minutes to approve tonight. So we will move immediately into our committee agenda. Item number one are land bank option applications, and I'll turn the floor over to Mr. Knapp. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, for tonight, uh, this is one of the first times in my time being here that we've received no staff comments or land bank advisory comments or resident comments for our applications this this time. Uh, the voting order that I, the possible vote voting order, we can vote on A1 through A8, and then A9 and A10 are the same property, and then we'll move on to our property transfers at the end. So A1, uh, is at 1600 South 86th Street. It's for a single family home. 
Uh, this uh, applicant has is currently almost completed one build on a land bank property. Uh, so this will be her second property. A2 is at 3719 Powell Avenue. Uh, the applicant is a contractor and he is going to build this property for his parents to live. A3 is at 1640 South 14th Street. Uh, it's for a single family home. Uh, they're either gonna live in it or sell. They weren't very sure, but uh, they do know that they wanted to build. Uh, A4 is at 3131 North 70 Terrace. Uh, this is a contractor that's going to build a home and their plan is to rent it. Uh, the next four applications are from the same applicant. Uh, this is the first time that we're seeing them. Um, I do have to say that they are a contractor. They have already met with uh, Mr. Hand in planning and went re reviewed their uh, what, what they want to do. Uh, they are requesting five properties in the Strawberry Hill and the surrounding area. So um, the first one is at uh, 517 Elizabeth. A6 is at 624 Orville. A7 is at 752 Sandusky Avenue. It's actually two parcels that they're going to combine into one. And then a8 is at 645 Sandusky Avenue. Uh, so, Commissioner, that completes items A1 through A8. Thank you, Mr. Knapp. Does any member of the committee have comments or questions for Mr. Knapp about any of these items? Commissioner Burroughs. Thank you, Commissioner Burroughs at Large District 2. Jed, are these going to be owner occupied homes that are built, not rentals or uh, uh, short term rentals? Uh, I don't ask if they're going to be short-term rentals, but uh, I do know that A A one the applicant is selling se selling the property. Uh, A two is a like it's a contractor building for for his parents. Um, A three is just they're going to live in it or sell it. I'm they weren't sure. I I don't ask that question, so I don't. But the ones that really concern me more are the the ones by the one developer. Uh, that has requested five properties. I mean, I'm, I'm all about infill housing. I just want to ensure that it's not going to be built and then be rentals. I don't think the community would like to see rentals if they uh, they just soon see uh, build a, build a purchase. That's my that was my question. Uh, so this uh, A5 through A8, uh, they said that they're going to sell them. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Commissioner, we could um, then follow up with that and say that our new special use permit process that has a density maximum would also help to address the question that you're concerned about, that if there are other rentals in uh, short-term rentals in the area, that that new permit process would preclude additional from being um, rented. So I appreciate your comment on that. And up front, they should know that. The builder should know that up front that if he if that's what he was planning on doing, that he may want to look at the SUP requirement on uh, short term rentals. You know that would be great, Mr. Knapp. If you could just routinely inform anybody who is building about the fact that we have recently updated our special use permit process for short term rentals. That way, they go into it eyes wide open. If that happens to be their end game with uh, a construction project, I, I will do, Commissioner. Thank you. Commissioner Davis. I would even take it a step further and make your job easier, maybe including something in the application and then maybe a link uh, on the website. That way it's very, very clear because there is a big thing happening in the market where people are just purchasing homes or building homes for the sole purpose of short-term rentals and they've become a real competitors. So that can make your job easier if we just put it on the application and put it on the website. Thank you, Chair. Absolutely. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other comments or questions from the committee? I'll ask the clerk if we received any correspondence related to any of these applications. No written comments were received. Is there anyone online who'd like to offer comment on any of these applications? Seeing no hands, is there anyone in the room who'd like to offer comment on any of these applications? Seeing no one coming forward, 
we have A1 through A8 up for consideration. Is there a motion? Davis moves to approve. Tight second. We have a motion and a second to approve A1 through A8 as submitted. Roll call, please. Roll call, Bynum. Aye. Stites, Davis. Aye. Townsend. Aye. Burroughs. Aye. McKiernan. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Knapp. All right. I'm A9 and A10 are both single family homes. Uh, they both applied for the same lot. Um, they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty much the same applicant. They've, they've applied, but haven't built anything yet. Like, uh, so A, A9 actually applied second and A10 applied first. Um, and A10 recently got approved for 1116 Washington Boulevard in, in May, and they've signed the option with us and they're coming back to build more. Um, so it's, it's basically this, the contractors are the same. Well, they're different, but they have the same, and they're uh, basically A10 applied first. We appreciate that. Comments or questions from the committee? I would say that in the absence of any comments or questions, I would be inclined to um, give this option to the person who applied first. And I, I could have sworn I saw a hand. Yes. And I'm guessing Commissioner Townsend yeah. was going to offer the same observation as me. Uh, this is Commissioner Townsend, District 1. I, I can't tell if my hand is raised or not from the graphic that's up. It is um, no longer. It is no longer. Okay, well, consider it raised. Thank you for acknowledging. Uh, it, yeah, I'm just wondering, do we have Mr. Knapp? Why do we allow someone puts in for a particular parcel? Why do we not tell the next person, the second person, third person, that a part uh, a applicant who's seeking that is no longer available until the commission votes on it? Why do we accept even more than one request for the same parcel of property? I, I review these applications once a month. So when I pull when, when I pull the batch off the form, I just enter them and I try to get the applicant to I talk to both of them and try to compromise and this one just didn't work. Yeah. Okay, but I'm saying if you can identify that um applicant that shown as number 10 was the first to apply, why don't we just tell any subsequent applicant it, it's not available? until the commission approves or declines that application. Why do we see two for the same piece of property? If I could, this is Wendy Green with legal. Um, that's because the previous direction to that has been provided to the land make manager is that everything comes forward to the standing committee for approval. Um, he hasn't before been given much direction that he himself has authority to not bring things forward. So up to this point, everything comes forward. So if that's going to be his direction in the future, that would be great. If that we could even add that to the policy that we're reviewing right now, that would be great too. But before that was never a direction. Thank you, counselor. Yes, that does put Mr. Napton in an awkward position. I don't know what it would take, but I would certainly um, advocate that if once we get an application for a particular parcel that any subsequent applicant at the same time be told no until this committee acts on that application. I think it would make Mr. Knapp's job easier and it, it, it just seems more logical to me. So that would be my offering um, for Thank a change. You. Commissioner Stites? Well, I agree. Um, and Wendy, what do we have to do to change that? Um, we can just put it in the next policy. Okay. Uh, well, let's mm -hmm. put it in the next policy. If, uh, that's agreed upon by everyone else. I would certainly agree to that. And that would, uh, so if Mr. Knapp pulls a batch and he finds two applications for the same policy that have different dates that he would notify everyone after the first applicant that that parcel has previously been applied for and 
that if the first applicant does not follow through, if for whatever reason that first application does not follow through, then the second applicant may be able to come back. Yeah, and I think that, however, if we think about the wording on it, that applicant number two would be the next person contacted. You know, that way three or four or five doesn't step up and beat number two to the punch, if that makes sense, right? The second applicant would have the first right if uh, applicant number one falls through for whatever reason. Thank you, Commissioner. I'll go back to Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, based on um, what I've said previously, I would just move on this item identified as what um, A10 Cortez B uh, move for approval. David, second. Thank you. There's been a motion and a second uh, to accept A10 as submitted. I'll just ask the clerk if we got any written correspondence regarding either of these applications. No comments were received. I'll ask if anyone online has any comments on either of these applications. Seeing no hands, I'll ask if there's anyone in the room who'd like to comment on either of these applications. Seeing no one come forward, we'll have a roll call, please, to award A10. Roll call, Bynum? Aye. Stites? Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. McKiernan. Aye. Motion carried. Thank you. That takes us to item two, land bank property transfers. Again, Mr. Knapp. Thank you, Commissioner. So uh, the first one, uh, PT1, is for a yard extension. It is for a landlocked parcel. Uh, the property owner is at 1740. So it's right. This property is behind his. So it's an un un unbuildable lot. Can't sell it. Can't build. Uh, PT2 is at uh, 1060 Minnesota Avenue. Uh, this is, uh, there's a building there. Uh, the Unified Government wants this for a stormwater project. Okay, so let me let me clarify this. This is another one of those cases where the land bank has the property, but we have not yet transferred it to the unified government. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a, there was a, a fellow who was on this committee. I don't know who it might have been who suggested that we might just transfer all of those properties and avoid doing it piecemeal in the future. But let's just be clear: this is already owned by the Wyandotte County Land Bank who seeks to transfer it to the unified government. Yes, Commissioner. Perfect. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions from the committee? Uh, I'll just ask if there were any um, correspondence received regarding this particular item. No correspondence. I should, I'm sorry, these two items. No correspondence received. I'll ask if there's anyone online who'd like to comment on either of these two property transfer applications. Seeing no hands raised, I'll ask if there's anyone in the audience who would like to comment on either of these two property transfer applications. Seeing no one coming forward. Davis moves to approve. Five seconds. Absolutely, we have a motion and a second. I'll recognize Commissioner Stites. Well, I'm not sure who that person would have been many years ago that suggested that, but apparently that didn't get uh, accomplished, right? So, Wendy, what do we have to do to do what that unknown person asked uh, many years ago? Probably many, many, many years ago. Actually, that did happen. We oh. did go through and transfer a lot of property from the land bank over to the unified government. I think this originally was going to be held out to the public because there is a building on it. Is that not correct, Jen? Yes. Yeah. So this originally was supposed to be held out for option agreements or rehab, but because the UG, the public works determined that they wanted to include it, did it to the stormwater. Now that's why we're transferring it. We originally had not intended to transfer it to the unified government. Well, good job. <laughs> that's thank you for clarifying that. Actually, I'm assuming that that building may come down as a part of this overall project. Yes. If so, that will save us the long-term upkeep of said buildings. So this will turn out well for us in the long run to help us accomplish our stormwater objectives mm -hmm. and to get rid of a property that we would otherwise have to secure and maintain. I love it. There's been a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Roll call. Bynum? Aye. Seitz? 
Davis. Aye. Townsend. Aye. Burroughs. Aye. McKiernan. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. That takes us to the end of our agenda. Is there a motion to adjourn? Davis so moved. Second. It's been a motion and a second to adjourn. Roll call, please. Roll call. Bynum. Aye. Stites. Aye. Davis. Aye. Townsend. Aye. Burroughs. Aye. McKiernan. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, committee. Thanks for your work.